Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Erie, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in the final trailer for The Eternals. So the first trailer was more of a tease to get us all curious and excited about The Eternals, but this one actually explains who they are, and most importantly, why the heck they didn't help out when Thanos destroyed half of all life. Phase 4 has a lot of explaining to do. We're not here to talk about the Avengers. Oh no? No. What they did was supposed to happen. The trailer begins with Ajak, who is the leader of the Eternals, catching the audience up on how this movie connects to Endgame. Yesterday's Entertainment Weekly revealed that every Eternal has a special ability, and hers is to heal others. In the comics, Ajak has another ability that could be way more important to this movie that I'll talk about in a bit. Sudden return of the population provided the necessary energy for the emergence to begin. So what is this emergence that she's talking about? Well, as we see later in the trailer, the Eternals were sent to Earth to fight the Deviants. Okay then, so who are the Deviants? In the comics, these crazy powerful godlike Tron giants called the Celestials came to Earth thousands of years ago and tampered with humanity's genes. They created the beautiful godlike Eternals, monsters that live underground called Deviants, and then gave humanity a hidden ability to one day get superpowers which is why we have heroes like Spider-Man or mutants like the X-Men. This is called the Celestial Gene, as opposed to my neighbor Gene. What do you bring to the table? Sex appeal. Oh. In the comics, the Deviants and Eternals have been at war for thousands of years, but the movies have tweaked this origin a bit, making the Eternals extraterrestrials who were sent to Earth to protect mankind from the Deviants, who we finally see in this trailer, eh, you know. So the Deviants have a lot in common with Kurt Russell's ego. They're both the children of the Celestials who have been abandoned by their parents. It's interesting that Ajak is talking so much about Thanos because in the comics, he is a Deviant. Long story short, some of the Eternals actually split off and made a new civilization on Saturn's moon, Titan. Thanos was born on Titan, but with a dominant Deviant gene, which is why he doesn't look like an Eternal. So I think it would be awesome if the Eternals were actually the people of Titan, and it was revealed that Thanos was actually a genetic offshoot who always felt like an outcast among his people. It would explain why they were so horrified by his casual genocide suggestion. And I'm pretty sure it's official. So back to the emergence. This could be referring to the re-emergence of the Deviants. 7,000 years ago, the Eternals successfully drove them back underground, and now they've been awakened. And by the way, in the comics, the Eternals became the basis for many myths and gods, including Icarus and Sprite. And the Deviants were the origin for humanity's stories about demons living underground in hell. And we do have another theory about the emergence that I'll get into later in the video. How long do we have? Seven days. So the movie introduces a ticking clock of one week. Now, seven days is interesting because in the Bible, God created the world in seven days and then rested on the seventh. Now, the godlike Eternals have seven days to save the world from becoming hell on Earth. She's speaking to Richard Madden's Icarus, who, as we see in the trailer, can fly and shoot laser beams from his eyes. Wait, is this who the Collector was talking about? Are you sure you cannot fly or shoot lasers out of your eyes or something? The trailer also features the crashing waves of a tsunami. Now, in the comics, the Deviants used a similar tsunami to sink Atlantis, whose people then mutated and became undersea dwellers, just like we saw in Aquaman. Very likely, we're going to see this in this movie, since it's rumored that Namor, the king of Atlantis, will be the antagonist in Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Then, Jimmy Chan's character Cersei takes over the narration. She's probably speaking to the main human cast member, Dane Whitman, played by by Kit Harington. In the comics, Dane is an inventor who discovers a cursed sword called the Ebony Blade, and he becomes the Avenger Black Knight. In fact, we have a whole video that breaks down his entire weird history. You should really check it out. In fact, both he and Cersei become Avengers, so this could be the MCU planting some seeds for a future team. In the movie, Cersei and Icarus dated for thousands of years, but now they're on a break, and she started seeing this mortal, Jon Snow. We see the Eternals without their full uniforms, being endowed with powers by a giant statue. This this is a statue of a celestial who we're going to see later in the trailer. Now, this is likely their origin story, showing how they were first instructed to come to Earth. And we see the Eternals entering the solar system and Icarus defending a human child. Although, you know, given the life expectancy of Paleolithic humans, this guy is probably like middle age. Then he asks the big question. Why didn't you guys help fight Thanos? And then we see them standing by during the Crusades and an atomic bomb blast. And Cersei's all like, because that's not my job. I'm not even supposed to be here today. Now, this atomic bomb blast might also 
also be the emergence that we hear about in the trailer, which we have a theory that we're going to explain later in the video. We see a brief shot of Ajax comforting Fastos, played by Brian Tyree Henry. His power, as we saw in the last trailer, is to invent stuff. So I'm wondering if he's also fallen in love with the mortal and he's mourning him after he died. Then Dane asks who the Eternals are working for and we get a look at their creators, the Celestials. This Celestial is named Arashem. It's the leader of the Celestials, though it does look similar to Ison the Searcher, who we saw using his power stone to wipe out a civilization in Guardians of the Galaxy. Now the reason Ison was using the stone was because the Celestials would routinely return to the worlds that they had tampered with and judge them worthy or not worthy for survival. Remember that for later. This is interesting because the MCU, until now, has led us to think the Celestials are extinct. Nowhere is inside a severed celestial head, and Ego claimed that he was the last celestial. Drift in the cosmos utterly and entirely alone. And the title card for this November, notice this symbol, which is in the shape of a DNA helix, a nod to the Eternals' history of gene manipulation. Then, Ajak and Icarus begin their quest to get the band back together, very similar to Neil Gaiman's Celestial's run in the 2000s, except apparently this team has retained their memories. No! One of the reasons why they may be trying to find each other is so they can create the Unimind. This is basically when all the Eternals combine their consciousness into one unstoppable force, and only the leader of the Eternals can control the Unimind. So next, we see Druig, who in the comics is the bad boy of the Eternals. He's always manipulating others, trying to become the person who controls the Unimind. He actually has the ability to control other people's thoughts, and it looks like that's what he's doing here, creating a cult that worships him in the woods. Next is Sprite, played by 15-year-old Lisa McHugh. Now, this character was the basis for the myths of fairies, similar to Puck. Angelina Jolie is Thena, who can create weapons made of energy out of thin air. I'm wondering if she's drawing the energy from other dimensions, much like Doctor Strange. She's sparring with Don Lee, who is playing the mythical hero Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is an ancient Babylonian story. It's actually the first recorded myth. Gilgamesh struck him with his sword. <laughs> Gilgamesh. Portions of this movie will actually take place at the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Hi. And then we see Kamal Nanjiani's King Go, who has become a Bollywood star. Next, we see a volcano erupting with crackling energy, and I think this is the emergence. Sprite says, This is what the end of the world looks like. Indicating that this is the return of the Deviants. But notice that she's wearing her eternal suit, not her human clothes. This also looks like the area where they first arrived. So I'm guessing that the Eternals' journey begins and ends on this same hill, where they originally drove the Deviants back into the Earth. You know what's never saved the planet? Your sarcasm. So here we've returned to the Eternal ship and the collection of Makari. She's the basis for the Greek god Mercury. Her powers are super speed and she's played by deaf actress Lauren Ridloff. Now she's the Eternal who really didn't bother hanging out on Earth with the humans, instead preferring to swipe their stuff and read all of their books. We're probably going to have a lot of fun with this scene like ancient missing artifacts like, I don't know, like the arms of the Venus de Milo and stuff. And then we see the Eternals, mostly reunited, raising their ship from the Earth. It looks like some archaeologists have already beat them to it, judging by the shovel here. Love these people since the day we arrived. So this shot on the beach is actually the first one they filmed. In her Entertainment Weekly interview, Chloe Zhao described it as epic. The winds were roaring and she blasted operatic music as the cast first assembled in full costume together. And then we see Sprite in ancient Babylon entertaining the people. Now, she's doing this even though they swore not to interfere with humans, but Sprite's a mischievous character, kind of like Loki was in Norse mythology, and she likes to bend the when you love something, you protect it. So as she says this, we see Dane Whitman about to be crushed by a double-decker bus before Cersei, whose power is transmogrification, turn it into rose petals because, like I mentioned earlier, she's fallen in love with him. Now notice this does take place in England, hence the signs for fish and chips. And the Mac sign here is clearly a thinly veiled Easter egg to the movie Mac and Me. <laughs> Yep, and that's all it could possibly be. Then we see a few shots of Cersei activating something alien. Now this could be inside their ship or something else that's been left behind by a celestial. She seems surprised by whatever this is, making me think that this is where she's going to learn some new information. Maybe that the Eternals mission was actually in the service of genocidal gods who also created the Deviants. This would force the Deviants and the Eternals to put aside their differences and fight the greater threat. You know, kind of like in the show Loki. Then we see Kingo defending the village on a cliff and a shot of a celestial celestial being forming itself and creating something. This is awesome. We saw in Guardians Volume 2 that these versions of the Celestials create their own bodies at will. Over millions of years, I learned to control the molecules around me. 
this celestial might be creating an entire planet, or maybe the Eternals themselves. This celestial is most likely Jemiah, known as the Analyzer, and it's looking like Circe is having a vision of this, watching her creators do something that will cause the Eternals to turn against them. Then we see a few shots of the Eternals using their powers, which are all based around these geometric energy shapes, just like how their creator, Jack Kirby, drew them. And then we see that it's actually been a deviant narrating. You can't protect any of them. Okay, so there's a few things to unpack here. First of all, maybe he's talking about the Celestials and not the humans, like the Deviants are planning to rebel against their creators. It's also interesting that he's holding her in this sort of lover's pose and that she's under an enchantment. In the comics, Thena actually falls in love with the Deviant scientist, Zygo. I guess, Zygo, sure. And she also fell in love with a deviant leader named Crow. So she could be the key to linking these two societies together for some kind of mutual benefit. Then we see a few action scenes in modern day of Icarus fighting the deviants. Now these shots look like they take place in the woods where the Druid cult lives. Now, normally I would guess that Druid was in league with the deviants since he's pulled this before in the comics, but we also see him with the group later on. So this could just be a deviant attack. Then we cut to Circe and Icarus visiting Fastos' safe house. Notice how you can see a paper machine that he's tinkering with right beside this chessboard, and there's also one of those adult coloring books with some colored pencils right beside a PlayStation controller. So do you think there's any chance that a Sony cross promotion will happen here? Like Fastos will be playing a Spider-Man game and they show up at his house? Is this milk any good? What you using it for? Drink it. Yeah, no, nah, man, I'll use it to drink. There's also toy figures and Connect Four, making me wonder if Fastos might have a child. This could be the person that we saw him mourning earlier. These little figures offer us a clue because this one is shaped exactly like your mom. Icarus thinks the table is made of vibranium. <laughs> and it's just another piece of crap from Ikea. Now, we have a pretty awesome theory about the emergence from one of our writers and editors, Pavel. He thinks that the emergence is actually the emergence of a celestial who's been sleeping on Earth for centuries. In the comics, the celestial was named Tiamat. So basically, when the celestial wakes up, he'll judge if mankind is worthy to survive. Show me what you got. And if not, well, you know. Disqualified. So the Deviants might be trying to awaken the Celestials so they can be judged as the most worthy race on Earth and the Celestials will wipe out all of humankind. In the comics, Ajak is the only being with the ability to speak to Celestials, so this could come into play here. She might have to make an impassioned defense of humanity to save the world. Do you think that's likely or do you think the Eternals and the Deviants are going to join forces? Let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.